we are beginning chapter 7, which is about swaps. And the name is actually quite appropriate because as we go through the chapter, you'll see, well, that's exactly what's going on. There's a swap of something going on. These are OTC contracts over the counter. They are not exchange traded. They are contracts between two companies. And it is for the exchange of cash flows. Notice that it's not for the uh, delivery of uh, any uh, final amount of cash or not for the delivery of any underlying asset, but for the exchange of cash flow. So one side isn't delivering to the other side something. They're both delivering. Um, and this cash flow can be as a result of an interest rate or uh, currencies. So we're going to go through both of them. We'll start off with the interest rate swap which is typically labeled a plain vanilla interest rate swap, which is a fixed for floating. So one company will pay another company a fixed rate in exchange for receiving a floating rate of interest. And that floating rate of interest is usually LIBOR. So the example used throughout the chapter is between Intel and Microsoft. I see no reason to change that, so we'll continue with that. Microsoft has uh, is uh, paying as we see in this example, is going to pay Intel 5%. In exchange, Intel is going to pay Microsoft a floating rate. So Microsoft looks like it wants to pay a fixed rate of interest and probably outside owes a floating rate of interest. So if it owes a floating rate, it wants to receive that floating rate to cancel that out and in exchange pay the 5%. Intel, on the other hand, since it's receiving 5% and paying LIBOR, it looks like Intel wants to pay a floating rate, but externally has a fixed rate. <clears throat> so Microsoft will pay the fixed rate to Intel, which Intel will pass on to its outside creditors, and in exchange pay LIBOR for it. So we say that Intel is the floating rate payer, Microsoft is the fixed rate payer. Now, um, we need uh, an amount on which this is based on, and we'll go with 100 million externally. So for Microsoft to be receiving LIBOR, typically they would have a debt outstanding that they must pay LIBOR on, and Intel is receiving the fixed rate. So typically they would have a debt outstanding uh, on, uh, on which they would pay some fixed rate of interest. So when we describe Microsoft as the fixed rate payer, we're not saying that Microsoft has a, has a fixed rate debt that they must pay. We're saying that as a party to the swap, they're the fixed rate payer. So when we have a swap and one side is, is uh, 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 described as the fixed rate payer, we can assume that they must have a floating rate debt. If they're a fixed rate payer, they're, trying, they, they, they've, they're experiencing uh, externally uh, a floating rate interest. Intel is described as the floating rate payer to the swap, but externally, it's fixed rate. So let's be careful about uh, how we describe these. When we say Microsoft is a fixed rate payer, we mean as a party to the swap. That's all. Okay, so let's look at uh, a little of the mechanics uh, of how that works. Let's say that uh, Intel and Microsoft enter into the swap agreement on March 5th, 2012. It's a three-year swap agreement. Uh, with semi-annual payments. So there's our timeline right here, six months, one year, one and a half, two years, etc. And Microsoft, as the fixed rate payer, Microsoft will pay on the first coupon date, which is six months from now, 2.5 million. 5% 5 on 100 million semi-annual is 2.5. It is known with certainty on day zero, on March 5th, 2012, it is known with certainty that Microsoft will pay six coupon payments of 2.5 million over the three years. On day zero, it is also known with certainty what they will receive from Intel. They will get LIBOR. But LIBOR is the rate observed here and paid six months later. So when they enter into the swap on March the 5th, 2012, this first payment structure is known with certainty. All of this for Microsoft is known with certainty as well. All of this is known with certainty. What is uncertain are the next five payments. However, when we get 
to the six month period and this exchange of cash flow occurs, it is known with certainty at this time what the next payment will be. The next four are still uncertain. But once we get to that next coupon payment, then we know for sure what it will be six months from now. So the LIBOR received on the first coupon date is the LIBOR observed six months ago. That's an important point. I want you to keep that in mind. That when, especially this very, very first date on March 5th, this will save you some thinking and, and, and some frustration later on if you understand this now. On March 5th, it is known what certain, with certainty what LIBOR is because we can see it. And since we can see it, we know what this first payment is going to be with certainty. And I'll leave it at that, and you'll see where that comes in later on. But just keep that in mind that we know with certainty on day one, well, sorry, on day zero, I'll call it day zero, what that first payment is going to be. Let's move on. So let's uh, just uh, stretch out that example we finished with uh, with the, the three-year timeline with the semi-annual payments, the, uh, the uh, swap for fixed for floating. Here is time t equals zero. Here is the LIBOR that we can observe at that particular time. The first coupon date, and we can observe LIBOR at each of these coupon dates as well, except for the coupon payment that occurs on the very last date. We do not need an observation of LIBOR because each of these observations are for the next coupon date. So. How is this going to work? Let's, uh, let's uh, think it through. Microsoft is agreeing to pay Intel 5%. So on each of the coupon dates, starting at, at the first coupon date, Microsoft will pay 2.5 million for six payments. And Intel will pay uh, uh, Microsoft LIBOR. Well, LIBOR at time T equals zero was 4.2, which means the payment that occurs here is 4.2% of 100 million for six months, Microsoft will receive 2.1 million dollars on the day when LIBOR is observed to be 4.8 percent. And that can actually be confusing because you look at LIBOR, you say, but it's 4.8, why'd I get 2.1? Because you have to look back six months. The 4.2 is the 2.1 here. What we observe on the first coupon date of 4.8 is what we will receive on the second coupon date. So we get that here. Here we'll get, or Microsoft will get an inflow of 2.4 million. So if we follow it down, we can see we have 2.65 million here. We will receive 2.75, 2.8, and finally on the last coupon date, 2.85 million. Now, it's not the case where Microsoft writes a check for 2.5 million and Intel writes a check for 2.1 million. Uh, on the coupon payment date, it is simply just netted out and whoever owes pays. So on this case, Microsoft owes 2.5, would get 2.1, so we'll pay 400,000 to Intel. On this date, they will pay 100,000. On this date, it changes now. Intel owes 2.65, Microsoft owes 2.5, so Microsoft will get 150,000. On the next date, they'll get 250,000. Then we have 300,000, and finally we have 350,000. And so the payments are simply just netted out. Now, it's on a notional principle of 100 million. Notice that the 100 million doesn't change hands. It doesn't make sense for Microsoft to send over to Intel 100 million and for Intel to send over to Microsoft 100 million. If you're netting out, those two would net out anyways. So before I move on, let's make, uh, let's make a point here. This is an example, kind of a contrived example just to make a point. So it's not really a, a good reflection of how, this, how the market actually works out there. It's just meant to show you what a swap is at a very high level. So when we look at these, again, very simplified in this example. So let's just write the word simplified so that we understand. Why is this simplified? Because it ignores the day count, event, uh, day count convention. And you have to pay attention to that. Because if uh, in the real world a bond were sold, you have to be able to calculate 
uh, the accrued interest to the day, which means that if there's going, even if there's an exchange of cash flows on a notional principle, you still must count the interest accrued to the day. And we'll, uh, we'll go into detail about the day count convention a little bit later. But just keep in mind that it, these payments that are 2.5, that's nice and neat and tidy. But it may not actually, each payment may not actually be 2.5. It may be different. Uh, one of the payment dates might fall on a Saturday. You can't make the payment date on a Saturday. So if you made it on the Friday, it would be a different amount. If you waited till the Monday to make it, well, the different number of days. And same with the, um, uh, the LIBOR rate. It's every six months, but every six months doesn't have exactly 182.5 days. It's either 181 or 184, so these will not be exact. Let's just keep that in mind. Now, I think we understand what's going on here. Uh, one company is uh, experiencing a floating rate interest uh, in the marketplace and would prefer to have a fixed rate. Uh, another company has a fixed rate and would prefer to have a floating rate. So rather than each of them go out and renegotiate their loans or get new loans to cancel out the existing loans at the different rate, they just say, hey, look, you know what? Why don't we just swap? I'll pay your fixed rate and you pay my floating rate. We both owe the same amount of money. It's for the same amount of time. Let's just swap. And then we don't have to worry about anything. So the big question is, well, why are they doing that? Why, why use a swap to achieve that? I'm absolutely certain that if Microsoft wanted a floating rate of interest, they can get it. And if Intel wanted, uh, or sorry, if Microsoft wanted a fixed rate, they could get it. If, my, if Intel wanted a floating rate, they could get it. So the motivation here, it can't simply just be that they wish they had something else. And that's why they're swapping. There must be a bigger motivation. There must be a bigger why question behind why the marketplace for swaps is so big. We could argue, and this makes no sense, but here's the argument. You could argue that, well, um, all these companies are just making mistakes. Um, they're taking out fixed rate when they should have had floating rate, or they're taking out floating when they should have had fixed. They're all just making mistakes and trying to correct it. It's a market for corrections. Nah, that doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Companies uh, don't really do anything unless it actually saves the money, unless it actually decreases their costs. They don't make mistakes to the extent that the swaps market would be that big where everyone's saying, whoops, everyone's got the wrong kind of interest rate. <laughs> let's, uh, let's all start trading. There must be a bigger, deeper motivation behind it. So as we go through this chapter, rather than just look at, we'll look at a few applications of swaps, but I want you to ask the bigger question of, of, of saying, okay, well, I get, I get what we're doing in the swap, but why is the swaps market so big? What's the purpose of it beyond just changing my interest rate? There must be a greater purpose, and there is, and we'll see it.